Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you at our today's colloquium. Uh, we'll have a, an excellent speaker today, um, uh, Professor Tomasz Bulik. Uh, to, say, to say a few words about him, he completed his PhD in USA when he then spent a few years as a postdoc. Uh, then he returned to Poland and started uh, to working at um, uh, Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center in Warsaw and at the University uh, of Warsaw uh, in the Astronomical Observatory of our university. Uh, later on, he co-originated AstroCent, Particle Astrophysics Science and Technology Center, where he uh, now plays the role of the group leader. Uh, Not anymore. Not anymore. Not ah, anymore. Okay. Uh, so he played a role for several years, a group of uh, seismic sensor group leader. Um, and his scientific interests concentrate on uh, gravitational wave detection. Uh, he is involved in Virgo uh, project, um, um, one of the projects that study this phenomenon. And uh, he also uh, not um, working in the with, with the data obtained by, by but also uh, with preparation of the detectors and invention inventing of the detectors for, for the detection of uh, gravitational waves and uh, just to mention that the, um, uh, the fact that he published over uh, half thousand of scientific reviewed papers <laughs> that are cited above uh, 60,000 times I think. <coughs> Uh, so um, I'm sure that today's colloquium will be a great pleasure for us. Uh, so uh, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, I would like to uh, tell you this story about the sources of gravitational waves that we have been observing for the past nearly 10 years. And the story goes on uh, around these detectors. So on the left hand side you see the LIGO detectors, this, is, this one is in Livingston, Louisiana, this is in Hanford, Washington. Our Polish group is a member of uh, Virgo collaboration. Uh, however, Virgo, LIGO, and CAGRA are sharing their data and uh, the entire uh, gravitational wave community is working together to uh, find out uh, the gravitational wave sources to detect them and to interpret uh, the data. Uh, the gravitational wave observations that I will talk about comprise these three initial uh, periods, 01, 02, 03, and you can see the uh, detector sensitivities which are expressed in the uh, ranges to, to which these detectors were sensitive for binary neutron star mergers. The sensitivity to more massive mergers like binary black holes is larger. The range scales more or less as the mass in the power of 5-6. Uh, so the, the current uh, observations, the, the red line shows uh, today, uh, we already have uh, quite a lot of data, but it's not included yet uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. It's not published yet. Uh, so, uh, with the gravitational wave observations, uh, you can uh, show that uh, these detectors effectively uh, scan this four-dimensional volume in gigaparsec cube times, times year, uh, and as a, as a function of the amount of the four-dimensional volume, uh, we are uh, gathering more and more detections, so and, uh, this is roughly uh, nicely linear, so we see that these uh, sources uh, fill this volume uh, more or less uniformly. Uh, and by the way, by the time, by the end of 03, uh, we have gathered about uh, 100 detections. Most of these detections are, are binary black holes, and I will concentrate in this. Uh, talk on the binary black holes and their properties and their potential origin. So, uh, what can we measure with gravitational wave observations? 
the main parameter that we can measure is the chirp mass, which is this uh, combination of the individual masses of the uh, binary. And this is related uh, essentially to the uh, change in time, to the rate in that the signal changes its frequency in time. So we see this chirping signal. The, uh, by chirping signal, I mean this is a gravitational wave signal of two objects that are uh, on tighter and tighter orbit. The frequency increases, and the rate of the frequency increase gives us this uh, mass combination. Uh, if we do a more detailed analysis, uh, we can also find the uh, total mass and mass ratio, and from this we can get individual masses. But uh, chirp mass we can get with high precision, total mass and mass ratio is um, uh, a little bit uh, more difficult. And then we can also find two functions of the spins of the black holes, uh, which leave their imprint on the uh, gravitational wave uh, signal, so that's the effective spin, precession spin, and I'll talk uh, about them in a moment. And then we can have some statistical properties because if you have a hundred detections, you can uh, do some statistics with them, show what their properties are. So these are the masses of the uh, objects that we have uh, observed so far. Uh, the uh, orange dots are potential neutron stars, and in most cases, in, in these cases, we think that these are neutron stars by their masses. We don't have a real, direct, strong evidence that these were neutron stars, except for this event, where we saw an electromagnetic signature, which uh, must have been due to uh, coalescence of two neutron stars. And the blue dots uh, represent black holes, so you see that there is a whole uh, large population of uh, black holes, and the typical masses span the range from a few solar masses up to about 100 solar masses, and the merger products can go uh, even higher. And uh, one thing to notice is that this range of masses and the typical masses like 30, 50 solar masses is higher than the typical masses of uh, systems that we see in uh, X-ray binaries in our galaxy or in neighboring galaxies where we see a black hole accreting mass from a companion star and we see abundant X-rays from these uh, binary systems. Uh, now, uh, the primary mass distribution uh, is shown here. So this is the, we infer the primary mass, which is the more massive component of the binary, and then find the distribution. Then if you try to uh, fit uh, or model this distribution somehow, of course, you, know, you, you get what you put in because you have to assume something about the distribution when you make a fit, but generally, uh, whatever you do, you see that this mass distribution falls off roughly exponentially because this is linear scale, this is log scale, but that there is some structure, uh, so there are some preferred masses uh, around you know, 10, 10, 15 solar masses, then 20, uh, 35 solar masses, and the long tail stretching up to the uh, 80 and at, 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 the, at the farthest reach, we just have low number statistics. Uh, so this is one thing that we know about the, uh, the masses of these uh, objects. Then uh, the spins. Uh, the quantity that we can measure, as I said, is the effective spin, which is this nicely uh, presented <coughs> combination of the spins. Uh, and essentially, it is a mass-weighted uh, projection of the individual spin onto the angular momentum direction. So if the spins were maximal and aligned with the angular momentum, this quantity would be 1. If it would be anti-aligned, that would be minus 1. But if it's in the middle, <laughs> it can mean that uh, uh, the spins are in the plane of the... Uh, uh, so J, J is the oh. angular momentum of the binary. So the total J doesn't include the individual spin? No, does, it does not. But you should say it. 
Okay, so now I said it because you asked. <laughs> but it's a bit of a you know jargon in the. Uh, okay, uh, the typically, uh, well, I, I will have to tell you what, the, uh, what we know about the typical spins, uh, but uh, their contribution to, the to, to, the, to J is uh, small, it's about 0.1. Uh, okay, mm, but if, we, if, we, if, if chi effective is small, it can also mean that the spins are small. Uh, now, then there is the effective precession spin, which uh, is a function of the uh, coordinates uh, of these individual spins that lie in the orbital plane. Uh, and I, but but the, uh, the information that we get from here is uh, relatively minuscule, and we, 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 we don't know a lot about the spins, apart from the fact that as I will show you, the spins cannot be uh, too large. So this is a combination of the spins that lie in the plane uh, of the orbit. And you assume that the chi is constant or what? The chi uh, is constant. Sorry, but I mean not this chi, the other chi. The chi. Chi t, whatever it is. Uh, it is, uh, it should be constant. I mean, this pr the spins can process. Uh, but uh, chi p should be constant. Mm, okay, so uh, if you look at the distribution of the spins uh, in uh, the 100 detections, so on the left hand side we have, we have the chi effective, so uh, the peak of the distribution is at about 0.1, the width is about uh, 0.3, the total 0.3, 0.4 uh, of the of this distribution. But the main point, so so the main point is that this uh, value is slightly positive, which means that on the average, the spins on the average, but not in the individual cases, the spins of the black holes are slightly aligned with the angular momentum of the binary. So it's uh, so the distribution of spins is not. Isotropic. It's not, uh, there is some relation here, but the distribution is wide, and we also have cases where the uh, spins are anti-aligned with the angular momentum. What is the information you get for the polarization of the exponential wave? Uh, we get it fr uh, from the waveform. We don't need polarization for that. Then uh, for the perpendicular uh, uh, part of the spin, we see that uh, it peaks at around 0.2 and it shows that the value of the spin in the uh, uh, plane of the orbit is r relatively small. By, by small I'm saying it's smaller than unity, smaller than the maximum value. And if the spins were maximal, this distribution would have been much wider. We would have cases where the effective spin would go to above the value of 0.5 or 0.6 uh, unless the spins are tend to be aligned in the, uh, uh, in the orbital plane, which is not the case because then this value would go, would go higher. So from this and from the modeling, we know uh, we infer that the typical spins of the black holes in these systems are slightly aligned with the angular momentum, with the orbital angular momentum, and the, their values are of the order of 0.2 with some, with some errors, but not typically 0.5 or 0.9. So spins are small in this, uh, uh, in this picture. Now, uh, the uh, statistical properties are as follows. We, uh, now with 100 objects, we can try to estimate something like the rate density of the mergers as a function of the redshift. So far, it's up to the redshift of 1, 1.5, uh, with large errors in the upper part. And we see that the rate density of the mergers increases with redshift. So 
in the earlier universe, up to redshift 1.5 that we have seen, the merger rate density was higher than it is now. And uh, in order to guide the eye, there is a line that corresponds to this picture, which is the star formation rate history in the universe, uh, which show, you know, th th that peaked at around two. We don't reach the two here. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, this, this line uh, has this similar slope as, as this line here, which can mean that uh, if we want uh, to make the sources, uh, you know, it doesn't prove anything, but it tells us that there, may, uh, there is a consistency between star formation rate history and the merger rate uh, density. Now, uh, the rate on. what does the, the, the... Because if the rate is higher, it means that the masses are higher, what is the... The, the uh, star formation rate? No, no the, this rate? This this is the, the like number of mergers per gigaparsec cube per year. Uh -huh. Just a number, you know, all masses integrated regardless of the mass. Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, first is, uh, so what are the challenges now in forming these systems from normal stellar evolution? The first one is the so-called uh, black hole mass challenge. And the point here is that if you uh, look at the relation for single stars between the initial stellar mass and the mass of a black hole that is formed out of that uh, star, uh, it is uh, limited by uh, two things. One is the metallicity and the winds because the stars, the more massive stars are very bright and they tend to lose a lot of mass. So by the time they start form, are ready to form a black hole, their mass is much smaller than it was initially. And the amount of the mass lost in those winds is related to the metallicity of uh, the stars. So if a star contains a lot of metals, which is everything else than hydrogen and helium, then uh, the opacity is higher and they lose mass like crazy and then they cannot form massive black holes. So then these black holes are typically uh, 20 or so solar masses and make, even making, you know, with solar metallicity, a black hole with the mass of 30, 40 solar masses seems extremely difficult. Then the second uh, limiting factor here is uh, the so-called so per instability supernova. And the per instability supernova are due to the fact that if we have a massive star uh, and it evolves, uh, it uh, has a high temperature inside, it has uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, high energy photons in the center and the high energy photons, once they are high energy <laughs> enough, create electron-positron pairs. And uh, something like that is catastrophic for a star because once you, you know, if you have a pair of photons, these are nice particles with a lot of momentum, so they contribute a lot to, to pressure. If you co uh, convert them to an electron-positron pair, suddenly this electron and positron have a little momentum because most of the energy went to mass. And they contribute very little to pressure. So, uh, once this process turns on, uh, that leads to instability, which uh, initially for lower mass stars leads to pulsations. For higher mass stars, it can lead to uh, catastrophic pulsations that uh, disrupts the entire stars and star and leaves no remnant. And the top limit on the black hole mass because of this process is about 60 to 70 solar masses. So making black holes above 65, more or less, solar masses in the standard stellar evolutionary scenario is very, very difficult. Of course, you can twist and turn the model parameters and stretch it a little bit here, but the more you stretch it to like 80, the less probable these models are. So that's the uh, problem with per instability supernovae. Now there is the uh, black hole spin challenge. So I sh have shown that the black hole spins 
are small, they are not maximal. While uh, in uh, gravitation, in, in X-ray sources, there is quite a lot of uh, cis black holes for which spins are estimated to be close to maximal, to about uh, 0.9, like 70% of them are uh, much higher. Uh, so uh, the... This spin is uh, black hole spin is a dimensionless quantity between zero and one. Ah. One corresponds to a black hole which has all of its mass energy in spin. Uh, essentially, so you know, if you look at the Kerr solution, then you, the, the spin parameter is between zero and one. It's a dimensionless uh, parameter. So uh, this is the. The, the challenge uh, that we have to explain. Uh, but uh, as I say, the, so, so black hole spins in accreting binaries, if you look at their distribution, there is some that are low, but there is quite uh, a number of them that are higher. And uh, we don't see this large subpopulation of high uh, spins, high spin black holes in uh, uh, in gravitational wave uh, sources. Uh, however, uh, you know, the, uh, there is, uh, okay, the explanation here uh, can come from uh, the fact that, <coughs> I mean, from, from two, two arguments. One is that if we look at uh, young neutron stars, young pulsars, their spins are typically uh, of the order of tens to a hundred milliseconds. The pulsar in the Crab Nebula has the spin of 33 milliseconds, but uh, uh, so initially it must have been around 20 milliseconds or so, th a thousand years ago. And if we look at the population of pulsars, their spins are of the same order, 10 to 100 milliseconds. And 10 to 100 milliseconds for a neutron star is actually slow rotation if you compare it to maximal rotation. The maximum rotation, which would correspond to maximum spin, would correspond to a spin of less than one millisecond, to a period of one millisecond. So we know that in supernova explosions where we form neutron stars, neutron stars are formed not maximally spinning, but they are formed with low spins. Black holes and formation of black holes is another story, but there may be some uh, similarities. And another argument is based on the observation of gamma ray bursts. Long gamma ray bursts are believed to be sources which are formed in supernova, in collapses of uh, massive stars, where you collapse the uh, core and make a quickly spinning black hole, which accretes matter and then ejects matter uh, along the uh, black hole axis, it ma the matter plows through the star, and then we see jets that cause the um, gamma ray burst. And the rate of gamma ray bursts in the universe is about one uh, per several minutes in the universe. Now, observed rate is uh, a different story because this takes care of the um, fact that uh, the the GRBs are beamed and we see less of them be beamed towards us. But the number of supernovae in the universe is about one per second. So uh, GRBs which are related to quickly spinning black holes are about 100 times less abundant than all the supernovae, which means that most of the uh, black holes or compact objects cannot form GRBs and therefore they may be forming with low spins because otherwise we would see many more GRBs. So I think that the low spin uh, detection in uh, gravitational wave sources is uh, consistent with the stellar uh, evolution origin of these uh, sources. Then there is the evolutionary problem. If you take a binary of two stars that are 30 solar masses and you put them on a very tight orbit, uh, this orbit is still larger uh, than the required separation of the two black holes that we need 
for the two black holes to merge in Hubble time. And that doesn't take into account the fact that the, these stars, like 30 solar mass stars, will evolve to giant stages and their radii will grow by a factor of a hundred or more, or a few hundred. Which uh, <laughs> means that uh, essentially we have to find a mechanism to make the black holes and bring them, put them together somehow so that they can merge due to gravitational waves within the Hubble time or shorter. So that's this black hole separation problem. And then uh, there is the rate problem. So uh, based on the gravitational wave uh, observations, we can estimate the rate density for binary black holes, which is this value, 17 to 45 in this nice units. Uh, and so, you know, if you, see, if you have a number, you have to compare it with something. You know, just a number doesn't tell you anything. But if we know that there is one supernova per 100 years in our galaxy, and we know the density of, ga of galaxies in the universe, we can find what is the rate of supernovae in uh, the local universe. It's about 10 to the 5 per year in the same units. Uh, the formation rate of black holes is roughly 10 times smaller, which comes from the spectrum of uh, masses of stars, so it's about 10 to the 4. So this number is about, uh, point, it's about 0.1 or to 1% of this number. So about one black hole in 100 to 1,000 that are made must make it into a merging compact object binary. And I'm saying that this is quite a large number. It's not easy to make them. So the scenario that we involve, that we invent for making binary black holes cannot be exceptional. It cannot be relying on putting them in some very special environment. It has to be very generic so that we can uh, get the efficiency of like one in a hundred, one in a thousand that we put into the merging uh, black holes. Uh, so uh, black hole masses and spins, this is uh, a little bit of a problem. The highest uh, masses of the black holes, which reach uh, 80 to 90 solar masses, I think are a challenge. Below that, we are fine. We can make them with low metallicity evolution. Uh, orbital separation problem. Uh, we need to work a little. I'll show you what the uh, um, problems, uh, how this can be uh, solved. Uh, then there is the rate. I mean, there is quite a lot of them. So uh, what models do we have? How can we solve uh, all of that? Uh, we have the stellar models. So models based on standard stellar evolution. Uh, and uh, this these are, of course, my favorites. <laughs> and they involve the models of standard binary evolution in galaxies, where binaries uh, evolve by themselves and are not touched by anything else. Then there are cluster models. So we have these objects called globular clusters, where, which are very dense uh, <coughs> ensembles of stars, and in those ensembles of stars, the density is like 10 to the 4 per parsec cube. Uh, so we expect that stars or binaries collide, or, and then they, in, in a collision like that, they can exchange partners and exchange properties. So, and these collisions are relatively frequent in the course of the evolution. Uh, then uh, it, it also includes the central clusters in galaxies where, uh, where, where we can also have mo more massive uh, and uh, regions where this type of processes take place. And there is the AGN disk models where this dense region is the region in uh, active galactic nuclei disks. And I'm, I have some, I, I'm very skeptical about this model. Then there are primordial black holes, which I will mention uh, as well. Uh, and uh, let me talk about uh, these models in uh, detail. So this is the star formation rate. Again, so we see this is co consistent with uh, this part of the, uh, um, of the rate. But 
uh, we see that, so you know, we have seen that uh, we need to produce the, uh, this black holes from more likely uh, low metallicity uh, objects because we want to produce black holes we, we, uh, that are uh, that with the masses of 30 to 60 solar masses. And in order to do that, we need to, f to model not only the star formation rate, but we need to model the star formation rate as a function of metallicity. So the general ev metallicity evolution or the chemical evolution of the universe uh, up, to, up to high redshifts. And uh, such a work has been undertaken by uh, this group and based on their results we can estimate the formation history and formation for the uh, binary uh, black holes. So the typically we scenario for, for, formating, for formation of uh, these systems in the st stellar evolution scenarios is we take the uh, star formation as a function of metallicity. We have some way of formation either in binaries or in clusters. Then we form binary black holes. Then we let them uh, evolve as uh, compact object binaries, uh, slowly uh, emitting gravitational waves and spiraling. Then we have the merger and then uh, gravitational waves travel and then we, then we see them. Uh, so, uh, the first scenario that I want to talk about is the scenario where we uh, do the isolated binary evolution. So, the stars evolve just by themselves in galaxies. They do not interact with other stars. And the point here is that in such a scenario, we, if, if, the star, no, if the stars are far, far away, uh, they will never make a merging binary black hole. So they must be close enough, and if they are close enough, they must evolve as binaries, and uh, that involves several episodes of mass transfer. And mass transfer alters the orbit. And here we have uh, a scenario like that, where uh, the first mass transfer is a typical mass, mass transfer from a main sequence to a main sequence star. Uh, this star loses its uh, envelope, it leaves the core, the other star gets uh, much more mass. So we, we essentially form uh, a system where we have a black hole and, uh, and another star on a relatively tight orbit. This, uh, and then there is the clue that uh, the magic that happens here, which is the fact that when we have a, a black hole and a mo massive companion, the mm, mass transfer episode is unstable and what happens is called the common envelope, where we uh, eject the envelope of the companion at the expense of the orbital energy of the binary. And this leads to a uh, decrease of the orbital separation and ejection of the uh, envelope. So we end up with the black hole and the core of the companion. Uh, and uh, if you see uh, the, um, the orbit here can tighten by a factor of 30. And that's the magic that brings the two objects together because then we make a black hole from the core of the companion and we can have a merging binary. The only thing is that uh, this has to work, which is a very... Uh, uh, difficult process with uh, unequilibrium uh, mechanics. It uh, has, uh, I mean, one case like this uh, of a merger of two stars have been observed, but uh, what may happen here is that <clears throat> if uh, we do not, uh, if we put the black hole too close to the star initially, uh, this black hole will end up merging with the star and will form something called Torn-Zhitkov object. So it's a star with a black hole inside. Uh, if it's too wide, then we'll not be able to expand the envelope. So there is a little bit of uh, difficulty here. Sorry? Yes. Is it possible that just the two stars 
before they form what's called they somehow merge together and they need gravitational waves? Well, but they, if, if they do so, this will be very low frequency because their separation will be determined by their radii and the radii of these stars will be uh, much larger. So, uh, you know, if, uh, this will be in the very low frequency band. So we, we could not observe it? Not now. Not now. If there is a star with a black hole inside, then does that mean the black hole feeds the star slowly? Uh, then, uh, you know, the, this is quite a... <laughs> when, uh, then the luminosity of that star will be determined by accretion luminosity onto the black hole. Uh, and this object will be short-lived, so in the end, you know, the, the, the question is about what will be the uh, effect of suddenly increasing the power uh, above the nuclear power of the star. So what will probably happen is that the envelope will expand, the core will uh, contract and collapse onto a, small, uh, onto a black hole, and uh, something like that sh sh should happen. But that will be on a short time scale, and uh, you know, finding the observational signature of, of, of a merger like that is not, uh, is not easy. All right. So the second option are the globular clusters. So that's a picture of a globular clusters, 10 to 4, 10 to 7 solar masses. Stellar collision, uh, collisions are possible. There is a very low escape velocity. And uh, in cluster evolutions, we can have hierarchical formation of binary black holes. And here is an example uh, scenario that uh, leads to uh, ah, I forgot to say one thing. So the, the, the <laughs> one important thing in this scenario is that because of the mass transfers, uh, we also transfer angular momentum from, one, from the star to a black hole. And there is lots of ways to make the black hole spins slightly aligned. Yes? Uh, oops, 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 oops. And then here we have the cluster evolution. It's much easier to make binary black holes because the, you, know, you are not stuck with one partner. You know, if you start with one partner, there is always a way to change it <laughs> and uh, get, usually in this collision, you can get a heavier partner easily. And, but the, you know, the source of partners is much more abundant and uh, you can make them in collisions. Uh, that is uh, generally the nice way that heavy, uh, uh, heavy stars, heavier stars uh, sink into the center of the glo globular clusters. So the rate of collisions increases there, especially uh, 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 especially so, so forming black holes is, uh, is easier. And the spins in this case, you, you forget uh, your you know, relation of the spin to your initial angular momentum when you were formed. So you form binary black holes with random orientation of spins in this scenario. Uh, and, but but you, you, it's easier to make them, so uh, the efficiency of making them is higher than in this, in this first scenario, which is shown here that if you, f uh, if you define something like black hole uh, formation efficiency, which is the number of black hole per all the mass in the system, uh, it's a factor of five to six higher for globular clusters. That's a function of metallicity. And this is in the field, so that's the standard binary evolution, which really drops down uh, with, uh, with metallicity as well. And this is like the maximum value that you could expect if all the black holes you have in a system uh, form binary black holes, but you assume the standard stellar uh, initial mass uh, function. So this cannot be larger uh, than 2 times 10 to minus 3 per solar mass. Uh, then uh, the AGN disk model, uh, so black holes are born in stellar evolution. They are caught in the accretion disks around uh, massive black holes and black binary black holes are formed in multi-body interactions in AGN disks. 
and then the mergers are in the disks. So spins would be isotropic because of the f way they are formed, but the rate essentially would be small. And this is because the fraction of all stellar mass that is in AGN disks is about 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6 of all the stellar mass available. So even if we make the uh, binary black holes with 100% efficiency there, there is not enough of this environment to make up for the, uh, for the, observed, uh, for the observed rate. And now uh, primordial binaries. So here we have a lot of freedom, right? We, we don't really know uh, how they would be formed, uh, what masses they would be formed. The masses should correspond to some uh, transitions in the early uh, universe. Uh, typically, from my understanding of the field, is that these masses are below one solar mass. Uh, their spins should be random, because we, uh, the idea is that you make them as you know, they make uh, first the black holes in this, but then they, uh, in pass bys, they make binaries, or they you, you make them in some uh, relatively dense regions in the early universe, and they start to they have to make binaries to be to to to, to, to be observed this way. So uh, then the spins should be random on the average zero, the effective spins. And uh, the, the spins should be very small. They cannot be uh, significant because we do not you know if we have if, if they form from collapsing of small regions below horizon in the early universe. I think that making this small regions spinning is extremely difficult. It's enough to uh, make them uh, dense enough to collapse, but making them spinning is uh, another uh, degree up. Uh, and then the rates do not have to follow the star formation rate, and they uh, are uncertain, and they scale as this F squared, where F is the fraction of uh, dark matter that forms, that uh, constitutes uh, black holes. And so, okay, let's compare this with observations. So, basic rate arguments that I have mentioned is that Formation uh, uh, must be very generic. You cannot ex invent very fancy and unusual scenarios because there is so many of these events. So this uh, scenario has to uh, cannot be exceptional. Uh, then stellar regions can contribute, and this is because uh, the Dense stellar regions uh, are in dense stellar regions. It is easy to make black holes above the per instability uh, gap because we can have hierarchical mergers. So we can make black holes that uh, are not directly formed from stellar evolution, but they can more made, be made from mergers and have higher masses that will then merge again and uh, overcome the, uh, this, this problem. And the exotic models I'm uh, skeptical. So with binary evolution, uh, we have a problem with the masses because we see two heavy black holes. We see these black holes above 60 solar masses, up to 80 to even 90 now solar masses. Uh, and making them is very difficult because of the pair instability uh, uh, problem. However, so we expect the, spin, the effective spins to be slightly positive. Uh, and I don't think that small spins that we observe them in comparison to X-ray binaries are a, are a big problem. And the rates should follow with some delay the star formation rate. So uh, these two things fit, and this is uh, a problem. For the cluster evolution, Masses, as I said, can extend above the per instability uh, supernova gap because of the hierarchical mergers. Uh, the spins should be on the average zero, so, but they are not. Uh, and uh, the, what, we, what we should see, and this is uh, now being investigated, is that if you have a merger, then the product of the mergers has to have the spin of around 0.7, because that's 
how much the angular momentum of the binary goes into the merger product. So if we have hierarchical mergers, then more massive mergers should have higher spins. Uh, and uh, this is now a, a big question whether this uh, we, we really see, see it. The rates should increase and follow star formation rate, but the peak should be at higher redshifts because uh, st star formation uh, or globular cluster formation rate peaked at, uh, earlier in the universe than the uh, peak of the typical star formation. Uh, for the AGN uh, model, there is uh, the problem that the rates are very low, and, uh, but there is a possibility of s forming a rare eccentric high mass binaries over there. Uh, and there is one case of a, that, that sparked a lot of uh, uh, discussion, which is this case where there was a quasar flare 35 days after the merger, and it was interpreted as uh, the uh, interaction of the merger uh, like a wave that uh, created by the merger with the central black hole. I think that this is still under discussion, but in my opinion, the AGN model cannot account for more than 1% of 0.1% of all the events. Uh, now the primordial binaries, uh, we don't know the, <laughs> the distribution of masses. Uh, and uh, we do not see any uh, mergers below the stellar limit, so below the, like, one solar mass. If we saw something like at 0.5 solar masses, that would be very strongly indication, strong indication that we see something primordial. Uh, spins are positive, uh, so a subpopulation of primordial is, is possible, but in this case, we do not expect the rates to follow star formation rate and because they are, this is completely unrelated. So what we should see is something flatter than we, than we see, I think. Uh, and I think that there is uh, quite a lot of evidence that the primordial black holes are a very tiny fraction of the dark matter halo. So if you look at the Ogle results, which looks for the uh, dark objects in the halo, uh, the limits around uh, 10 solar masses are that less than 10 to minus 2 of uh, the dark matter in the halo is, uh, is in uh, black holes. If you look at uh, X-ray limits uh, as a function of the, the mass, this uh, fraction is even lower, below 10 to minus 3. And as I said, the rate uh, scales as uh, this number squared. So uh, essentially the rate, even if we assume that, they, that all of these primordial black holes make binaries and they merge now, this rate uh, is lower than uh, 10 to minus 4 in this, in this unit. So I think that uh, primordial black holes are essentially ruled out as a source of uh, merging of, of signals that we see in gravitational uh, waves. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, this is the summary of it. So the summary here is that if we see all these models, uh, the primordial can explain the masses because we don't know what to expect. They cannot explain the spins but they can, uh, uh, well, but uh, they can contribute as a part, but the rates are completely off. For the binary model, we have the problem with masses. For the cluster model, we have the problem with spins. So I think that uh, the combination of these two models is where we should go, that if we go to binary evolution, and the cluster evolution and stellar origin of uh, the uh, uh, merging uh, binary black holes, we, are, uh, uh, we can uh, find, uh, find the solution. But no single model can, exp can explain it. And uh, to finish, you know, this is the current status. Uh, by the end of 25, we should have the results from the 04 run, which will increase the statistics by a factor of three. Then 
uh, at the end of the decade we'll have uh, another run which will probably increase our statistics and find more mergers uh, and uh, tell us more about the parameters. Uh, so that will be the next uh, step in, uh, in this field. And the long next step will be Einstein telescope, which will probably materialize around 2040. So that's a, that's a long uh, story forward. Uh, and Einstein telescope will allow us to see mergers beyond the redshift of two. So if we see the peak in the merger rate density, which corresponds to the peak in the star formation rate, then this will be like a silver bullet that confirms these uh, scenarios. So we'll have to wait for that. So with this, I'll thank you and I'll wait for questions. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Uh, the paper is open for questions. Are there any events recorded which are not uh, from, uh, from mergers of compact objects? No, we don't have, uh, I mean, we are looking for other types of mergers we, or, or events. Uh, like we are looking for uh, signals from all sorts of exotic events, uh, like cosmic strings. We are looking for uh, supernovae, and there is a search where we correlate, uh, try to find, look for the uh, gravitational wave signal correlated with nearby supernovae with no success. The best case is uh, two point se uh, sigma of 2.7. Uh, which was not published. I, th I think maybe it was published, but it's not 2.7, so it's uh, not uh, the, the... And I, I am kind of skeptical about that. Uh, uh, then we look for signals from uh, asymmetric rotating neutron stars, so continuous wave signals. And uh, there is a lot of... S we, al we also look for uh, gravitational wave background from all the mergers that happen between here and uh, the beginning of the universe. And for this signal, assuming that we know the rate densities quite well, we should have a detection by the end of the decade. For other signals, it's, you know, we don't know. <laughs> for gamma ray bursts, I mean, we, we look for signals from gamma ray bursts, but, uh, you know, the only one case where we saw the signal was this GW170817, which was seen in gravitational waves, and there was a coincident weak uh, GRB. That was an event extremely close at 40 megaparsecs. And uh, I think that this, we were extremely lucky to see it, uh, because that's, uh, that seems to be a very rare event. Uh, to see a GRB from such a short distance. The typical distances to GRBs that we see with you know, uh, the detectors are redshift of one to two, so the distances are in several gigaparsecs. With this, we are sensitive to 100 or 150 megaparsecs. So uh, I think that uh, we hope to see something like that. Uh, I know that in, I can say that so far in O4 we have not seen a very nice binary neutron star event uh, that would trigger electromagnetic follow-up. Uh, so I think that for that we'll have to wait for better instruments to get a, a huge statistics. We can get one, two, three events, but not, not more of that. So looking at a uh, gravitational wave signal, can you tell the difference whether this was binary neutron star merger or this okay, prime, so prim, primordial, primordial black, black holes, holes of the same masses? Uh, okay, so uh, if we see it with high signal to noise for uh, binary neutron stars, uh, for, you know, if one of the components was a neutron star, some of the energy will go into squeezing tidally sc uh, or stretching, tidally stretching the neutron star before the merger. And this leaves an imprint 
on the waveform because there is some energy left that has to be put into the uh, the stretching. So that's the the way to to, to do that. But unless but, you have, but it's not possible with the present sensitivity. Or with present sensitivity, we have uh, very weak detection of the squeezing for this one event that I have mentioned with the uh, the GRB coincident. But so, so there is, uh, uh, you know. A way to measure the uh, you know, say young modulus of <laughs> of a neutron star, and uh, we we have a weak, not significant uh, detection. So the pro pro probability is like has a little peak above zero. So over there, apart, uh, we we have uh, we have some measurement, but at, with this sensitivities of the detector, the this event would have to be extremely close and high signal to noise. Thank you. So I wanted to ask a follow-up question about uh, neutron stars. Uh, I remember that somewhere around the first detections, it was mentioned that we should see a few such events in the coming years, and then we would be able to measure the Hubble mm, constant. constant. Okay. As far as I know, so far we had just one event, right? And yes. uh, so with this, the, the accuracy so is not so good. So what's the prospect for that? And the so other question is we, why, we why there are fewer events that were expected? <laughs> Well, the, the, the reason why there are fewer is that the universe doesn't cooperate with us as we would like to. <laughs> but uh, we have, uh, we had, uh, you know, in 03 we had two events. Uh, one of them was good enough uh, so that we saw the electromagnetic and the, uh, and the gravitational wave signal. We could measure the Hubble constant even just with the uh, gravitational wave uh, wave data, but you know the error bar is uh, not uh, enough to constrain the Hubble constant problem. Uh, now there is uh, also you know you can also measure the Hubble constant uh, statistically by looking at the location uh, in the sky and the distance estimate and considering all the galaxies that are in this. You know, it's usually like a banana in the sky, uh, uh, and assuming that uh, each galaxy is uh, in in this uh, region is the host galaxy. Uh, so, but but that takes more time, and uh, in order to get a decent measurement, we'll need something like a few hundred to a thousand uh, measurements. But yes, I would like to see more binary neutron <laughs> stars, but somehow <laughs> it's not working like we can trigger this. Uh, <clears throat> in your models, which you described, the dark matter doesn't exist at all. Is it a kind of a secondary effect? Like I can imagine that, you know, you kind of it can influence, uh, it can have a kind of a screening effect on your signals. I think that uh, dark matter essentially, uh, so you know, what can dark matter do in, in the, these models? Essentially, uh, you know, the density of dark matter uh, uh, and the influence on the binaries is minuscule because you know, within this volume uh, that we consider for a gravitationally, say, confined volume of a binary, uh, the amount of dark matter is much smaller than, you know, th than, the, the, than the masses. Where dark matter, I think, can uh, contribute, work, what can happen is that neutron stars can accrete dark matter, and then we can have neutron stars with dark matter contents. And uh, it took me a while to understand why, but the, uh, the, the reason is simple, that if there is some cross-section for dark matter on the ordinary matter, then the optical depth for a, a dark matter particle through a neutron star, through a star, scales as one over the size of that star squared. Uh, because the density goes w one over distance squared and the radius is, uh, so it's r over r to the cube. So for a neutron star, the optical depth to catch dark, dark matter is about 10 to the 10 times larger than for, the, for a star. So 
it's much more uh, so over the time, like say, hundred million years of uh, time that a dark, uh, that a neutron star floats around, it can uh, catch maybe some amount of dark matter depending on the cross section. And that would uh, then show up in the fact that we would have a plethora of different neutron stars because the neutron stars would not have just mass and uh, radius, but there would be an extra degree of freedom, which is dark matter contents. But I don't think that dark matter would influence the formation scenarios that I have shown here, because there's just not enough dark matter to make any uh, significant uh, influence in comparison to gas or mass outflow or whatever, or mass transfer. <laughs> Yes. If you assume that dark matter is just single sorts of particles, mm -hmm. then yes, but of course, if it has a structure and many sorts of particles and yeah, you can form <laughs> some macroscopic objects of the, in the dark matter world, then essential, essentially you can do everything. Yes, of course. So that's assuming, you know, we, we, we don't really know, yes, but if there is a, some cross-section, then we can, you can catch some of these objects, particles, whatever they are, in neutron stars. Hi, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. The first one's really simple. Uh, what is the uh, statistical significance right now for the for the preference of the of the spins to be aligned? Uh, what is this? I, I don't really know. Well, uh, for the mean see, to I be mean, above zero, right? Now. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, I think that this is, uh, you know, uh, I haven't seen like the discussion about that, but the plot I have shown you uh, in the very beginning, uh, oops, 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 this one, this is uh, essentially the sum of all the probability densities for a hundred mergers, or the average. Uh, so, uh, I think that this is, uh, you know, uh, it's not that this is like a st 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 statistical, statistical fluctuation. This is many sigmas, but uh, I cannot give you the number. Okay, uh, thanks. And then the second question is about the primordial black hole rates. Um, so if I like look at the naive bound mm -hmm. plots for these, usually the usually the the rate uh, estimated from LIGO is the strongest bound. It's stronger than these bounds from uh, from microlensing or from uh, X-rays and and radio, uh, so so I, I I don't know if I quite understood what what the no 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 I think is. that the uh, no the, the the bounds from LIGO uh, are uh, for the very low mass uh, black holes uh, so you know the Bounds are really, uh, as far as I remember, uh, for, for dark matter are for the mergers below one solar mass. Uh, no, no, you you can you can set bounds at uh, you know thirty solar mass, hundred solar but mass. But for and, and, thirty solar and mass, we have detections. I mean, exactly. You, 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 so you, if you, if you, if it's going to be all of uh, all completely explained by prim primordial black holes, then it has to be of order ten to the minus three of, of dark matter, which is uh, which is still broadly. Uh, acceptable compared to these other Ah, okay, the, uh, go, going this way. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, if you go the other way, if you go from the dark halo and uh, from compact objects in dark halo and try to predict what would be the merger rate if you m make all of the uh, black holes in the halo merge, between uh, you know, the formation and now, then uh, the rates, the expected rates, would be of the order of this, much lower. Because, so, so I mean, the, if, if you try to predict what are the expected rates based on your theoretical model of mergers, then the, knowing the, these limits, I think that th th they come up to be uh, about 10 to minus 6 of what is observed. Uh, but if these are only the binaries that are formed in the halo, that's not the majority of the binaries that you have. The majority of the binaries, I think you alluded to this, are formed 
in the early universe, not in the But, not you in know, universe. anyway, uh, these binaries form dark matter. Most of the dark matter sits in the halo. Sure. So if these binaries were formed early on, they must, um, and, and they continue to exist, they must now merge in the halo. Okay. So they must be in the halo. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. uh, I'll talk to you after. Okay. Thanks. So with that, um, we are going to finish our uh, I mean, our mm -hmm. colloquium today. Uh, it is December, and the holidays are, are on the horizon. So, wish you uh, a Merry Christmas. And uh, the next uh, colloquium will be on the 15th of January. So we already invite you to this event.